G'day and welcome to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Today we're going through my full first round big board 2.0, giving you all the updates and rises and falls in the most recent big board. Let's go! Jordan, open! Chicago with the lead! Not a game. We talking about practice. LeBron James with no regard for human life. AD Bogdanovich. Back out to Allen. His three-pointer. Curry for three. Wow! Unbelievable. Making it rain in New York. We the North are now we the champions. Not the destination, it's the journey. Mamba out. Good day and. Welcome again to the Ball Boys Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Casey, and you can find me on Twitter at Ball Boys Fantasy. Coming at you with another draft uh, video slash podcast today. So counting down the days to the draft, which are fast approaching. Obviously, we've got the NBA Finals going on right now. Sadly, my Boston Celtics did not make it, but we're not here to have a pity party about the Celtics result. We're here to talk to you about my big board. The most, or the only big board I've done to date so far, we covered the top 14 prospects. Today, we're going to be going through the entire first round, my top 30 prospects as it stands right now. I've also broken these down into tiers as well. And um, there's a few shakers, even in the ones that I have already revealed. And of course, we'll talk about some of the players that we haven't yet discussed on this podcast before. Um, so... Without mucking around too much, uh, let's get straight into it. Tier number one, you already know it's really not a discussion point at this point. Uh, Victor Wembanyama is the number one pick in the draft. He's in a tier on his own. And look, I don't really know what else there is to discuss. We'll obviously get into all of his fantasy translations, but... If you haven't already seen my top 25 dynasty rankings, he was number three on that list. Spoiler alert, and he actually has gone at number three in both the mock drafts that I've been involved in at the moment with a few other fantasy analysts, and I have not drafted him there. There has been other analysts, I think, in one draft. It was Josh Lloyd who drafted him at number three after Jokic and Luka went. I can't remember who the other person was that drafted him at three in the other drafts, but he seems to be, I guess... The consensus seems to be about that two, three, four kind of a range, depending on what do you want to do with your draft. But I like him there at number three, and that's what I would do him in a fantasy basketball uh, dynasty startup draft. But in terms of the NBA prospects, he is clearly number one. And in my opinion, clearly at number two is Scoot Henderson, who I have here in a tier of his own. So tier two. Number two ranked prospect is Scoot Henderson. And I don't think that this is going to budge for me either. Um, I just really like what he does in terms of his um, size. He, he's six foot two, but his wingspan, the size of his hands, the I think there's some good defense there as well. Sometimes a bit of a criticism of him. I think he has the potential to be a serviceable depend- defender despite being six foot two because of that strength, size, um, and also just reactiveness, defensive IQ, I think, is there as well. He's an excellent creator and passer as well. Um, just super athletic. I think the jump shot is going to come. I think the three-point shot will eventually get there and be serviceable, like sort of what a Jarma Rant has been able to do in his career. I just think that he is the... In most drafts, he would be number one. He probably, in my eyes, goes number one last year over someone potentially like Apollo Boncaro. Um, maybe it's up for the better. I haven't given that too much thought, but to me in this class, he is just a tier above anyone else. And even if I'm the Charlotte Hornets, I am drafting him at number two and figuring the everything else later because, uh, yeah, I don't think at the top of the draft you can afford to miss on a guy, in my estimation, who is a tier ahead of everyone else, despite maybe a slightly clunky fit. All right, at number tier number three, we have three players, and this has stayed the same as my last big board. I did weigh up putting Brandon Miller up a spot to number four, but I am pretty set on Amen Thompson being my number three um, prospect. There was a point where I sort of had him potentially moving into the tier up with Scoot Henderson. I still think that that if everything is said and done in the um, in this draft, we look back on this draft and. 
you know, Scoot ends up, you know, not being as good as Amen Thompson, I wouldn't be shocked. I think Amen Thompson and Asar Thompson, for that matter, have extremely high ceilings, very, very high ceilings. They are tier one athletes when it comes to NBA uh, players. I think that their IQ and uh, versatility is top notch as well. Obviously, the jump shot for both of these players is the concern. Amen Thompson gets a little bit of a higher because he's more of a live ball creator. You can see him potentially being that point guard. And as at six foot seven, that's an extremely valuable player to have on your team. But Asar to me is right there with him as well. I actually prefer his jump shot. It looks a lot smoother. There's a little bit less of that like hitch when he goes up for a shot. Looks a bit smoother, looks a bit more natural. And I've compared him to players like uh, Andre Iguodala at like a floor. And like a Jimmy Butler, who you wouldn't compare, you wouldn't say Jimmy Butler is a point guard, but he's definitely someone that can play make and use his aggressive attacking style, getting into the lanes and and finding players as a result of that. I can see Asar Thompson doing something like that across his career and with the athleticism that, athleticism that he has. I really like him. I'm probably higher than most people on Asar Thompson, but I think that there is an argument that they can be taken as high as three and four. And then at number five, I have Brennan Miller. Some people, obviously, with Charlotte Hornets, picking at number two, have Brennan Miller at, or going to their, um, going to them at two. Some people have him at number two on their big board. I disagree. I kind of see him as a, an excellent shooter. He's a big, versatile wing. I like the size. That's great. But I don't necessarily think I see star upside. Potentially, he makes a couple of all-star teams if it all goes well, but I think that is his ceiling, whereas the four guys I have ahead of him, I just see higher ceilings in terms of um, what they could potentially become because of the athleticism, because of the defensive versatility. Uh, I think there's just a bit more things there, whereas Brandon Miller is an excellent shooter. He's got great size, but outside of that, I just don't know if there's all that much else to get really excited for. Like, I think, sure, he can dribble it okay, but he's not a guy that I am that I think he's going to be able to create separation in the NBA going up against, you know, elite athletes. I don't think he's an excellent defensive um, prospect or anything like that. You know, at least a Jabari Smith from last year was touted as a really good defender, a really switchable player. He's actually older than Jabari Smith is now, so... If you had concerns about Jabari and what he looks like in the NBA part this past season, I think you might have similar concerns with a Brandon Miller, who maybe has a little bit more of a handle. But again, you you compare that with what I expect to be weaker defense, um, and and I would argue that that Jabari Smith is probably a better catch and shoot guy than a Brandon Miller. So for me, he is in this tier. But I have him at the end of the tier, and I have him at number five, and I. Almost considered dropping him down a tier, but I'm sticking him in this tier at the moment. So let's move on to tier number four. This is where I start to shake it up a little bit from my previous big board. So at number six, I have Taylor Hendricks, who's risen a couple of spots. And to me, he is now the top guy in this tier. I like him at six. I could even argue to have him as high as five, but I've got him here at six at the moment because, again, don't know if I see the the upside of a star player, but I see an excellent, excellent role player, an excellent startup level player on an NBA team in the vein of like a uh, Jaden McDaniels kind of a type who's really good shooter, really good defensive, switchable um, prospect who can uh, block shots, get steals, rebound solidly. The shot looks really nice. I think that that's projectable moving forward. Great size, long wingspan, could potentially, if he fills out, play some small ball center. If he, yeah, like I said, if he gets a bit stronger and can guard the pres- the paint presence down there. So I have him moved ahead of the other defensive prospect in this um, tier, Jarris Walker, who I think maintains his spot from seven last time, but just with Hendricks leapfrogging him here. I just think I'm banking on Hendricks's shot a little bit more. And I think whilst Jarris Walker is an excellent defender in his own right, just the fact that he's probably not, in my opinion, going to be as impactful on the offensive side of the things. I've just kind of decided that I think that that jump shot is going to be more valuable for teams than Walker's maybe slightly higher upside on defense. And you could even argue that they both have a similar ceiling in defense. So I think that Hendricks and Walker are pretty... I I like them at the top of this tier pretty convincingly. 
And then at number eight, another riser here. Kaysen Wallace has moved up my board. I think he was in the previous tier in the last big board, but I've got him up at eight now because um, I really like the defense that he provides. I think he's probably, again, one of the better defenders, especially as a guard position compared to even like another guy, as you can see here on um, YouTube in Anthony Black. I think he's probably a more impactful defender, kind of like I've said this before. He's kind of what... A lot of people hoped Davian Mitchell was going to be in his draft class. I see him as this guy. And again, the Kentucky factor, factoring in a potential little bit of an upside um, that we may not have seen yet. I think the jump shot is at least going to be serviceable in the NBA, which is nice. I think he can play point. I think he can play uh, the two as well. So you've got a bit of versatility there, depending on how your roster shakes out and things like that. So I have him at number eight. And at number nine is a guy that potentially I am falling on or, or getting lower on compared to consensus. So I see this guy as high as four, sometime, sorry, five, sometimes even four, and that is Cam Whitmore. Um, the thing that has me a little bit down on Cam Whitmore is the playmaking ability and I guess like the, the black hole-ish nature of his game. Now, this man, in a per 36 uh, minutes, averaged one assist in college, um, which is which is pretty shocking. Now, he's an explosive athlete. The jump shot looks okay. I don't know if I completely buy it as like a knockdown type shooter guy. So, and the defense is, I don't think he's like a, a, a cone on defense, but he's definitely someone who can, maybe is not necessarily a plus defender. So for me, I always have, and this is like sort of my bias and sort of my preference with players. If you're going to come into the NBA and your your calling card is offense, you better be bloody good at it because there are there are very very talented players in the NBA. And if you're going to go to an NBA team and be the number one or number two option, you've got to be really really good at that. And if you're not going to be a number one or number two option on offense, then you've got to be able to supplement that with something else. Now. Cam Whitmore has that upside, but I'm not completely sold on it. I'm not sold on the jump shot. I don't know if I can see him being a guy that's, you know, making those mid-range shots or doing, you know, uh, off the dribble threes or anything like that. I, I love his athleticism, but I just, I have my question marks about Cam Whitmore and whether or not what he did in college was simply because he was potentially so much more athletic than, ev- than everyone else. I don't know if that gets by in the NBA. Um, and so I've got him at nine. And I don't know. I think that's the low on the low end of where I see him in a lot of mock drafts and big boards. But this is where the more research I do, the more I get into the draft mode, which is what I'm doing right now, the more conviction I have, in my own opinion, different to consensus. And at number 10, I have Anthony Black, who... I am denied whether or not to put him in this tier or the tier, uh, the next tier down below, but I think that he is at least good enough on the defensive end. His size is strong enough that if he ever does develop a decent jump shot, he could be a very decent point guard in the NBA with decent size. Um, I just have question marks over those sort of things. So again, he kind of falls to the end of this tier just as a guy that I don't know. I don't really know what the upside is with Anthony Black. Um, people compare him to like Alonzo Ball, but not everyone's going to develop a jump shot like Alonzo Ball has in the NBA. And he obviously went to an organization with the Pelicans that um, fixed his jump shot after being at the Lakers and having a lot of question marks there. If he can land in the right situation, I can see it happening, but just as easily on the other side of things, if he lands in the wrong situation, I can see him potentially not working out very well at all and um, being a potential bit of a flop. So defense is great. The size is great. um, But I don't see him as like an amazing playmaker like some of the um, Thompson Twins or a Scoot Henderson. And I don't see the athleticism there like those boys as well. And when you also have a suspect jump shot, that brings you down the board a little bit in my eyes. So let's get into the next tier, tier number five. Tier number five, I've got a guy who I'm slowly becoming very high on compared to consensus, uh, maybe even into my boy status, but Kobe Bufkin is my guy here at number 11. I think he's moved up one or two spots from my last big board and could even start to get to the point where I pick him over an Anthony Black. But at the moment, I've got him in tier five at number 11. Now, he's just solid across the board. I like his jump shot. I like his ability to finish around the rim. I like his defensive ability as well. He looks like he's got a decent IQ out there. 
he's not explosively athletic, but I think he's athletic enough to do things in the NBA and hang with some of those guys that he might have to guard. He puts a lot of effort in on defense, so I do like him. The upside I don't think is amazing, but I think he could potentially be a very serviceable starting combo guard, point guard, shooting guard in the NBA, assuming that he is next to the right players. So I've got him at, at 11. Number 12, I've got Keontae, uh, Keontae George here, um, who, again, just up one spot. Maybe a little bit more upside than a Kobe Bufkin, but I just do, again, those slight question marks on those... Uh, what you call them, chuckers or guys who play the position like he does and has a score first mentality. I do like the fact that he was able to um, have a high usage in college. Um, you know, his his efficiency numbers weren't great, but he still, you know, did put up some decent points. He's again nineteen years old, six foot four, so good size. Um, the defense could come there with that size in the NBA. It's serviceable enough to to at least not be that sort of cone type. So I've got him at number 12 with a bit more, I guess, scoring potential than a Bufkin, but behind Bufkin because of the lack of maybe some of those, or question marks, I suppose, in those, some of those other areas in defense and maybe not quite as natural a playmaker as well. Uh, number 13, I've got Grady Dick, who I think used to be at number 11. Just dropped him down because I've brought those other boys up, and I think if you're calling card is shooting, there are some other good shooters later in the draft as well. And whilst I think he probably is the best shooter and he probably has better size than some of the guys later in the draft, there is there does come into that question, well, okay, how good are you with some other things that makes me take you in the lottery? He He's obviously not the most athletic type of player, skinny. Look, he can... He can uh, bounce a little bit, and he's, he's high IQ, cuts really well. It's one thing I really like about him. His cutting ability is something that I think will put him in good positions in the NBA. I just worry that is he is he how much of a liability is he going to be on defense? Um, is he going to be someone like a Duncan Robinson that really gets hunted out, or is he going to be someone that can at least hold his own? I think that's going to be a big thing for him. And the other thing, he's not he's not really a, a a creator with the ball in his hands. He's someone that is definitely going to be playing a lot of off-ball, which can work in some teams in the right situation. But again, the upside and ceiling, I don't think is very high for Grady Dick, but he should be very solid. And at number 14, this guy has cracked into the lottery for me. He wasn't in the, the draft or in the uh, the big board uh, podcast last time. So first new person in this, this list, Bilal Kulabali. I hope I've said that right, but... I am liking what I'm seeing from this man. And he is he's a guy that's been rising up big boards. He was on my radar, but I wasn't quite ready to pull the trigger on him in my last big board video. But I've got him there now at number 14. Um, from the uh, the Mets 92 over in France, the same team as Victor Wemenyamba. Played a little bit in their junior team or their, their second team and a little bit in their top team. In his junior team, the numbers were crazy. A little bit more modest in the senior team, but the the film looks really nice. He moves very fluidly. He looks extremely lanky, lanky from what I can see. Um, you know, Tankathon has got him listed here at uh, six foot six. There are some rumors that he is measured in at uh, six foot eight at the moment. If that is the case, I'm getting very excited. He looks a bit more like a six foot eight guy. I guess it's hard to know without knowing the heights of everyone else on the court, but. Um, just really like what I see here. And if the shooting is real and if the shooting can come along to a very efficient level, I just think that you've got a very high upside pick here. And at this point in the draft, I think that that's worth the swing here. And at worst, I think you've got, you know, those six foot six, six foot seven wings who can run, who can pass, who can play defense, a little bit of shooting there as well. That's just the most valuable position in the NBA. So I think at worst, you're going to have a rotation level player that has good size. And I think that the ceiling of a player like Bilal um, puts him at that 14 rank spot for me. Number 15, I've got my first, well, first guy outside of Victor, big man in Derek Lively, the second. Now, He's following along the success of like a, a Walker Kessler from last season. Now, his block numbers aren't quite as absurd as uh, Walker Kessler's were last year, but 
that same kind of vein. What's risen him up my board recently is some, again, we were reacting to all sorts of things at the moment in the NBA draft uh, landscape, but a lot of footage of him hitting threes and shooting uh, from outside recently, and the, the form looks quite good. He didn't display that at all in college. In fact, I think he had a, an extremely low usage in there, only scored 9.1 points per 36 minutes, but perhaps there's a little bit more there that we can unlock, and I think... You know, seven foot one, 19 years old. He does have a, a decent amount of upside to be a starting center in the NBA. I think there is potential there. So I have him at number 15. And if all goes well, he could end up being potentially, and this is, this is a high ceiling here for him, but like a Miles Turner type, someone who can stretch the floor a little bit and be an elite rim protector um, at seven foot one. I think, um, I think that he is someone that, definitely deserves a top 20 at least and I could even see him rising a little bit higher on my board the more I dig into his uh, shooting potential and at number 16 to wrap out this tier I have City Sissoko who from the uh, G League Ignite again another one of those wings 19 years old six foot seven I think I saw him measured out six foot six with no shoes on so probably six foot seven with shoes on in the NBA um, a decent wingspan as well. He looks strong as well, which is what I really like him. Um, a little bit different to like a Bilal Kulabali, who's a bit more uh, slighter frame. Um, City has at least got that strength already there, so he could just walk into the NBA and I think play decent uh, rotation minutes. Um, I think he, growing up, was playing a, a point guard role predominantly, so you've seen the flashes of some really good playmaking, and at six foot seven, that's really, really important in my opinion a good defender from what I've seen. The jump shot is probably the swing skill. If he can develop that jump shot and be a bit more of a threat on offense, he does have a high upside, which which brings him into this tier. Probably, from what I can see, not the ceiling or not the upside that like a Bilal has, but you could talk yourself into it if you really wanted to. So he's kind of in that vein. Worst case scenario, you've got a great rotational wing with good size and good defensive ability with some playmaking and a bit of shooting as well. So I think those kind of players are the most important in the NBA. So I've got him at number 16 in tier number five. All right, we're getting through it. Two more tiers to go in this big board. Tier number six. At number 17, I have Jordan Hawkins, who to me looks like if... Grady Dick is the best shooter. I think Jordan Hawkins is probably the next best, and he could have the argument to be the best shooter in the draft. The thing that I really like about Jordan Hawkins is his ability to shoot on the move. Um, He's risen up the board for me. I don't normally go for guys like this who are, you know, your shooters a little bit older. I'm trying to find his age here. Uh, He's 21, so whilst a lot of these other guys are 19, being 21 just dings him down a little bit, um, prevents him probably from getting into that tier above. But uh, obviously, you know, played really well in March Madness, um, was the best player on the championship team. And um, yeah, just the shooting looks amazing. So if, if if you get someone like a JJ Redick at pick 17, I think you're absolutely laughing. He has that kind of ceiling. The fact that he's six foot five. Um, and a skinny six foot five at that does concern me a little bit when you compare him to someone like a Grady Dick, six foot seven, and the guy next on this list, Jet Howard, six foot eight. That is a little bit of a concern, but from what I can tell of his fitness level, the, the ability to run nonstop Steph Curry style around screens, um, I think mitigates a little bit of that slight lack of size compared to those other guys. And I probably have the highest degree of confidence that he's going to be at least something in the NBA of all those shooters. I think I'm more confident in his ability to impact from the shooting of those other guys. The other thing with that small frame and slightly smaller size is how is he going to do on the defensive end? Now, he competes. He plays hard from what I can see, but sometimes that's not enough in the NBA. You've got to have the tools and you've got to have the length and the size to to guard those bigger players. Otherwise, they're just going to pick on you. And that's where I also do have some question marks on Jordan Hawkins. But as a shooter, you can't knock this man. And if he can have a JJ Redick career, well, then I think you pick him earlier than 17. But um, he has that potential. But again, we'll sort of see how it all all shakes out. At 18, I do have Jet Howard. So back-to-back shooters here. I just think that Jet Howard's size helps him, but I'm less convinced on his ability to 
you know, make that impact in the NBA like I think a Hawkins can. I don't know as much about his ability to shoot on the move, which is a very important skill in the NBA. Um, maybe a little bit more uh, ball on ball creation with a Jet Howard. I don't know if I'm out there on a limb to saying that he's a guy that you want the balls in his hand to like, you know, break people off the dribble, but he might have a little bit of that if required. Again, the defense is a slight concern. And, and the other thing with Jet Howard is the shot's not going down. What else can you give me? But again, you compare him to a Jordan Hawkins. He's nearly, he's a year and a half younger. He's three inches taller. So that's why I have both these guys close. close. So he probably has a higher upside, a higher ceiling than a Hawkins, but I'm a less confident that he will do what I think Hawkins will do in the NBA. At 19, we've got a run of the Jays here, but I've got Jalen hood Shafino, Just a, uh, a really solid, big point guard or combo guard guy with high feel. Solid defender. The jump shot has got to come around, but I think he's a guy that can just impact uh, an NBA team through just solid play. Kind of like a Kobe Bufkin, but I just don't know if I buy the jump shot quite as much and also... Um, maybe he isn't a um a starting level player in the NBA. There's there's a ceiling there that he does just because of the the feel that I think can get him there. I think that's obviously an, often an underrated aspect: the IQ, uh, the vision of players, especially when you have the size to go along with it. Um, so compare him to now. I'm not saying he's going to be this, but in in his draft year, like a Tyrese Halliburton was a similar kind of archetype of a player. So I think Jalen Huchifino has the ceiling to do that at the very best. Um, but I'm less confident compared to some of these other guys. So he sits at number 19. At number 20, um, Callum's boy, who I think Callum drafted him at 14 in our mock draft in the most recent video, uh, is Leonard Miller from, again, the G League Ignite. He was someone who could have come into the uh, NBA last season, chose to spend another year in the G League before declaring for the draft, and I think it's helped his stock. He's 19 and a half years old, six foot ten. Uh, numbers were really, really strong in the G League as well. So put up 16 points, 10 rebounds per game. Um, the thing here for me is his jump shot. Now, is the jump shot going to be there? From memory from last year, I think the jump shot was almost like the 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 bit of intrigue for him. So it's funny that that's now a bit of a question mark for him. It just looks real robotic, real... Uh, there's a bit of a hitch in it. He sort of pauses a little bit before he releases and flicks his wrist. Um, lefty, which, I don't know, worth noting. But the stats look really good. The size is amazing. He He's a guy that maybe can play a small ball center, but he's definitely versatile and... Um, fast, twitchy enough to guard players on the perimeter if he needs to. So I do see a little bit of upside with Leonard Miller here, but there is also a little bit of downside there as well. Number 21, Bryce Sensible. I've seen him a bit higher on this than this in a lot of other mock drafts as well. I've definitely bumped him down. I think he was number 14 in the most recent big board. So he has slid down my board. Again, more so just with uh, playmaking concerns. One point assists, 1.7 assists per 36 is not what I like to see. The defense is questionable. The points are great, but he's kind of like that Cam Whitmore type with obviously less athleticism, but more shooting. And those type of players, I just have a trouble putting you in the in an NBA team and saying, yep, you're going to be the guy that I'm going to want to put the ball in the hands of and go and get me a bucket and create something when I've got, I don't know, Devin Booker there or <laughs> Luka Doncic there or, or someone of that ilk. So I don't know if he can ever make it as a starter in the NBA. If he does, it's going to be on the back of like a catch and shoot kind of a guy. Um, the athleticism doesn't jump out the page to me. So I've got him down at 21, a little bit lower than I think consensus is. And then at 22 is a very interesting guy in Derek Whitehead, who obviously has had two foot surgeries, or I'm not sure if he's had the second one, but obviously had one at the start of the season, came back, played, you know, obviously wasn't right. Um, the shooting numbers were great. He was a very high high, um, high school recruit coming into this draft uh, class, but obviously injuries have slowed him down. You can look at it two different ways. He was playing injured and he still put up decent numbers, shot the ball really, really well. 
And um, so maybe there's a bit of upside that he's he's going to clear that up. And when he comes into the NBA, he's going to regain a little bit of that health and a bit more of a spring a step. Or the second way you can look at it, he's had two foot surgeries and that's a, a big red flag for teams drafting a player. Um, you know, he is young. And so I think it's it's not like you you can't be patient. He's not even 19 yet, 18.8 years old. So one of the younger guys in this draft class. But two foot surgeries before you're being drafted is a concern for me. So if it wasn't for that, he probably would be a little bit higher than this. But um, I think that at this point, he does have probably the most upside left of anyone left on the board, in my opinion. So that rounds out tier number six. And we'll move on to the last tier here. Tier seven to finish out our top 30. This is where I start to get a little bit more... I think these guys are going to change a fair bit uh, between now and draft day. But at 23, I have G.G. Jackson, who I've seen some crazy high <laughs> projections of this guy. I think, was it Raphael Barlow um, from the NBA Big Board or Locked On NBA Big Board had him as high as five? I definitely can't get around that from what I've seen. But super young, 18 and a half years old. I think he is potentially the youngest player in the draft or at least in the top 30 um, prospects here, but just um, has good size, six foot eight, six foot nine, 215 pounds. The stats don't jump off the page to you. And again, he's kind of one of those guys that is getting by in terms of potential and what he could be, but he isn't that yet. And I think a lot of the times if we look over if we revise draft history, a lot of these guys, more often than not, don't actually work out. But he is at 23 here for me in the off chance that he is one of those guys that bucks the trend. Uh, we didn't really see it in college from a statistical point of view. It's a lot of uh, potential at this point. I'm banking on the fact that you, you take the shot because he's got good size at this point. Um, but I don't think if I had to place money on it, that he really works out when it comes to the NBA. Number 24, Nick Smith Jr., another guy, similar kind of thing with injuries affecting him. And I'm probably even lower on him than a Gigi Jackson because he doesn't have the size. He hasn't had a second surgery or anything like that. So sometimes we sort of hear, oh, yeah, he played through injuries and things like that. And it might be legit, but it might also be the prospects and their camp kind of creating this narrative to sort of explain why they played poorly and things like that. And you've got to always take those kind of stories with a grain of salt. Now, he, he did have some injuries, but obviously he then came back onto the court and played. So if you're playing, we can only take that, you know, with what we see. So he's a guy that he's athletic, but outside of that, I don't know what else he he gives you. The jump shot is suspect. 2.4 assists, 2.3 rebounds per 36 minutes, 0.2 blocks, uh, 1.2 steals as an athletic guard. Look, he's got decent size as a guard. He is athletic. He can potentially score, or even that's a bit up in the air because he's not a great shooter. So I just don't really know what he does, and I can easily see him falling further down my list, um, and I already have him. I guess somewhat lower than other people at 24, but you know he might even potentially be out of my first round if I, you know, find some more players that I think uh, deserve to move up the ranks. Number 25, Brandon. I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Brandon Pozimski. Um, he is a guy who comes in here, played really well, I think, in the um, the combine. Uh, which is an interesting sort of thing as well. So actually played the games and and showed out nicely. Has decent size, 20 years old, so he's a sophomore, but he's still only 20, so I, I wouldn't consider that to be super, super old, but just has some good numbers and um, I think could be a serviceable rotation player with that six foot five, six foot six size. Um, shooting stroke looks nice, high feel kind of a player, so I like him here. At 26, Maxwell Lewis um, is a guy that I, I do I do quite like. He's, again, another older-ish prospect, nearly 21 years old. Um, again, good size, six foot seven. A lot of these guys have that really good size there. The shooting looks really nice. The defense is a little bit suspect for me, so that's why he's probably not going to get much higher than this on my board. But um, I think that... The, you know, the shooting is nice. He's able to play with a high usage in college. So I think that he could at least serve a good scoring punch off the uh, bench in the NBA. 
Number 27, we've got Ryan Ruper, who actually played down here in Australia in the NBL. Well, he played for, I think, New Zealand it was, in the Australian League. Um, maybe a little bit of an upside pick here. So compared to some of these last few guys that we've talked about, maybe he has the highest upside of a lot of these guys. He's a, uh, I think he's a French uh, player originally. Um, his wingspan, I think, is close to seven foot at six foot six. He's thin. He's skinny. Um, he's he's definitely a bit of a project at this point. The stats don't jump off the page. Kind of similar to, I'm blanking on the name, but this, very similar to the guys that play for New Zealand last year. But I, I like his aggression maybe a little bit more. I'm really br- blanking on that name. I'm going to have to Google that up. Okay, see Thunder draft picks 2022. You guys are going to be screaming out to me. Um as to who it was. Why can I not think of the guy who they drafted? That. uh, Oh, Usman Jang. (laughs) That's the guy I was thinking of. Very similar, I think, in terms of Usman Jang as that, like, prospect kind of guy with the athletic tools that are there, the size, the wingspan. I think he's a bit more aggressive. My my knock on uh, Jang last year was the passiveness in which he played which you can kind of give a little bit of a pass for when you're playing in a league like the NBA and it's like a professional league. But I saw a bit more aggressiveness from Ryan uh, in that league. The defensive ability theoretically is there and he's shown a little bit of passing chops there when given the opportunity. But again, you're going to have to be patient for a player like this and there is a risk that it just kind of flames out in my opinion as well. And then at number 28, Chris Murray, brother of Keegan Murray. I was not very high on Keegan Murray going to the draft last year. I'm less high on Chris Murray, as you can obviously see with this ranking. I just think he's going to come in and be a role player in the NBA. And look, there's some value in that. I think he'd be a pretty serviceable role player, good size. Um, Shooting should be okay, but I don't think the defense is going to be anything to write home about. Um, Just the fact that he's a six foot eight uh, player that can shoot a little bit has decent length, um, I think is worth something at some point. 29, I've got James Naji, who is an international prospect. Uh, He's from Barcelona and obviously wasn't playing many minutes in uh, a team over there, but super athletic, high defensive upside big man. He's young. He's not yet 19 years old, 6 foot 10. Um, Just again, could be someone that, with the size, the athleticism, um, rim running, vertical lob threat type that could potentially develop into a decent defensive anchor if everything goes all right. So I think there's a little bit of untapped potential there in James Naji. And at number 30, we have Colby Jones, who a bit of a, uh, a combo guard, a little bit older, a junior at college, 21 years old. Um, looks like he's built nicely and strongly. Um, can play physical, good size, six foot six, two hundred and ten pounds. Um, bit of a versatile player. Doesn't strike me as like a uh, fast twitch, bursty type of athlete, but will get by and do well, I think, based on good strength and good size. Um, and can shoot a little bit. I think his jump shot has improved a lot since being in college, um, which has risen up the board. So if you can maintain that, I think he again probably at this point you're looking at just serviceable role players. And Colby Jones could potentially give you that. And again, at six foot six, you like that size, and it's something you can at least bank on moving forward. So that is it, guys, for my uh, big board here. So let me know what your thoughts about all the NBA prospects. If there's anyone you think I missed in the first round that you are screaming, Mitch, where the hell is this guy? Let me know down in the comments below if you have any questions or comments about their fantasy uh, projections moving forward. It is hard to do the fantasy projections without knowing where they're going to land, but I have started obviously doing some of those translations as well and who I think could be good Uh, fantasy contributors for our dynasty leagues and for our redraft leagues in years to come. So let me know know down in the comments below. Give this video a big thumbs up, guys. Would really, really appreciate it as well. And if you uh, are liking more of these uh, videos, chuck it down in the comments and make sure you guys are subscribed. Until next time, we'll catch you then. Bye.